Facebook Live. Thanks for everybody tuning in today. It's our second event of the week. Uh, we wanted to do a recap, or I wanted to do a recap of the stone sheep hunt Brendan and I just got back from. Just talk about the, the hunt, the trip, the conditions we experienced, some of the gear we took, and just give you some tips and ideas of some of the things that worked really well. Um, we also tested some new product. Some of it worked great. Some of it from needs some work, but that's what we do up in the mountains, and that's really how we vet out new concepts and ideas and uh, talk a little bit about um, a little bit about the overview of the trip and again c kind of some of the gear and then really want to open up for a lot of questions I know we had a lot of questions come in the last event before I left we didn't get to answer as many so we're going to be open for questions so type them in and, and we'll answer as many as we can um, so hunt was tough there was a tough hunt tough conditions yeah um, a lot of people know British Columbia is burning up right now so we had yeah. Unusually hot, unusually smoky, low wind, which means bad visibility. Stone sheep are all about glassing. You know, you, you can't walk them down. You got to glass them up. And we ran into a lot of hot, smoky conditions. Um, yep. Very buggy down below, um, and a lot of the rams were. Uh, most of the sheep we think were down low. You know, it was it was just tough. Or just not moving. Yeah, just buried tough in the rocks. Yeah, it was. Um, and it was different. You know, doing, doing a lot of northern hunts. Even the stone sheep hunt we did a few years ago with Greg Williams. It was on glaciers. Uh, in BC, where we're hunting, there's it's a timbered bottom. It's yeah. thick. Uh, lots of lots of timber, and the sheep are living above timberline. And so for us, it was great because we loved a backpack hunt. Normally, it's a horseback area where they're traveling lots of distances, getting the position where they glass up high, and then making a move on around once they see it. We, we did just the opposite. We took our backpacks and backpacked and got up above Timberline. And a lot of the time we're at six, 7,000 feet, and above where there's any springs or water, we, we lived off a snowpack. Like Brendan said, it was, uh, we had decent conditions, although it was hot um, the first few days. And uh, you killed your ram on day two. Yep, fifth day I was there, day two of hunting. So you got it, yeah, Brennan got there early, went in and scouted yep. and found a ram, yep. watched him, finally felt comfortable with the size and the age and, and yep. made a move on him. Tell, tell us yep. a little bit about that. Yeah, I, uh, on the the first day I got in the mountains uh, on day, I guess it would be the second day, and I came in two days early because uh, when traveling up north we had, um, the, obviously, cameramen, Jason, everybody was coming in. It was good to get somebody out in the field earlier yep. because when you have four or five guys at the same time, you get weather, jam up. You want to be in there early. So I came up a couple days early, um, got in early, uh, got lucky on the first day. We were in mountain spot. We rode in about eight hours and then hiked another six to get in where we are and ended up picking up five rams that were running together, two little guys and three pretty nice. Two, two, two little guys, two seven-year-olds and one pretty uh, older ram, a 10-year-old, you know, um, and then watched them for four days, um, for three or four days in the, the evening of the – Second day of the season. Second day of the season. Yeah. August 2nd. Yeah, August 2nd in the evening. Um, he, he was bedded down these ridges. Um, he was in between two peaks, and I just positioned myself a couple hundred yards back in case the wind got bad and just basically banked on what he was going to do what he'd done in the morning. And he ended up walking down the same trail, came running down towards me, and uh, ended up making a pretty fast move on him and shot him with my bow at 48 yards. But a pretty um, unique shot. Yeah. I, uh, I got in between. Uh, it was kind of rolling, grassy stuff in between two peaks. And uh, I snuck up on him, and he was in the lead coming down with the other three rams. Um, and as I was getting up, I could see two backs, and I got lower and was cruising along. And closing the distance, I got about 85 yards from the other two rams. And I looked to my right, and he had me. And he had broke off and come around. And I, I just got a range on him at 40, 49 yards. Facing you. Facing me. Uh, he was facing a little bit right, uh, looking at me at 49 yards. But the hill was disappearing over the top. All I could see was basically this much of him and his head. I got a confident in the range I got on his head. And uh, Fred Bear killed his stone sheep uh, back in the in the '60s this way. And if you you know if your arrow's always going up and coming down after you shoot, so 20 yards in front of me was a hill, and I could see just enough of him to where I wanted to hit. So I just aimed at where I wanted to hit, and it arced over the hill and hit him perfect. Uh, took a double lung. Got him in the jugular and and, uh, and hit him in the heart. Down he went, fifty yards, just like that. Yeah, so amazing seems. accomplishment. I mean, how many stone sheep have been killed with archery? But a, not a lot. About one hundred and thirty have been taken with a bow in the last sixty years. So, it's amazing. Yeah, right place, at the right time. Generally, one of the hardest ones to get yeah. in North America. So it was awesome. Yeah. I mean, been dreaming about it since I was a little kid. So it was awesome. It was awesome, awesome deal. I uh, I was hunting with kind of a two on one situation with Donald Trump Jr. and. Uh, 
we went into a different mountain range. They had, the, the guide had found a bear in the four rams, one good one, about two days before season. We rode in, what did we ride in, 13 and a half miles the first day, spent the night, got up the first day of the season, backpacked up into this, it's kind of a small mountain range, and um, looked for the, that bound of sheep. We just couldn't locate them. We found two smaller rams that weren't legal, um, spent two days in there looking, and then found out that Brendan had killed his sheep, and he was coming back to base camp. So we pulled out of that mountain range, rode 13 miles back to base, and then the next day I got up and we rode another 13 miles into a new mountain range, area that's rugged, tough, really far in, and then backpacked there from the, the horses that evening until dark, and then hunted up the next morning up through a high pass, dropped our gear and equipment at a kind of a rocky saddle with, a, with, a, with snow, uh, so we have access to water, and then... Um, that day we went out uh, kind of across some uh, ribbon cliffs and we glassed back into this basin that we ended up calling Freedom Basin at the end of it <laughs> for a good reason and uh, spotted what, three rams about three in the afternoon. It was hot that morning and then thunderstorms came and it cooled off and the rams got up to feed. And uh, one of them was just a hell of a ram, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, huge ram. Scott Alexander made a, made a hell of a spot on it. Yeah. Down low, really dark ram, gray face. Um, and he's one of those rams you put the glass on and you're like, Oh, that's a good one. Yep. I mean, weight down low, deep, hoopy, kind of everything you want. Yep. It was. And it took us about, what, two and a half hours to get in position. We had to do a loop around. Storm came in. We got huge rainstorm, blasted with high winds, hail, going through cliffs to get there. Um, and then it ended up being perfect. The wind was good. We kind of came over these rolling ridges and had them at 350. Then the other two rounds were at 550. We couldn't have gotten closer, so it worked out perfect. Uh, Dom made two great shots. Only needed the first one. Yeah. Got it down and uh, yeah, it was it was a cool moment. He was yeah. he was excited. We were excited, and it's one of the most beautiful stone sheep I think I've ever seen. Great big ram. Yeah, Just I don't have any pictures to show you yet. Um, you know, we're holding off releasing them until we're we're, we're given the green light to do yeah. so. But it, yeah, Don, I tell you what, um, this is the first sheep hunt I've done with him, and he's the real deal, isn't he? Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty cool to see, and you never know how people are. No, nope, you don't. They do, but especially in those situations, you truly find. Yep. Whether they're a sheep hunter or not, pretty quick. He's a tough guy. Well, and everything he went through before he went, I mean, he could have easily pulled the pin, and he, he wouldn't give up on the idea of going sheep hunting with us. And, uh, you know, the first I remember the first day, we were, it was a big day, climbing with all the food the first day, and uh, we get to the top, of the, finally get to the top. And I look over, and I'm like, I guess you can climb. Yeah. <laughs> he, you know, people talk about and those that do it, and it was, it was a, a joy to have on the trip fit right in, and, and certainly um, tough. Well beyond what I would have thought or imagined, with you know, versus our upbringing, versus you know where he grew up, and you just yeah, learned a lot about him. It was yeah, it was really cool, and you know, no matter your political affiliation or whatever, but the what he had to go through to get on the trip was, uh, it, I mean, the dude likes to hunt because it was <laughs> yeah. certainly a pain in the ass. Yeah, it was. I mean, yeah. it's it's there's just a lot of, you know, we jump on an airplane and fly out there. That does not happen for him. No, and, and I met him in cool. Vancouver and, and met the Secret Service entourage and traveled north with them and yeah. It's a lot of people. You got to want to go yeah, to do that. It was. Yeah. It was. He was a joy to hunt with, and uh, I know he had a great time. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. A tremendous round. Just yeah. a huge. Yeah. yeah. And he had to, he had to leave to get back to deal with the stuff going on in DC and um, and uh, his his business. But uh, yeah, and then after we killed Don's ram, it got really hot, um, really dry, and we went what six or seven straight days. And we didn't see another legal, another, not another ram. Not another ram for seven days. Using lambs to be out, the rams weren't moving. And uh, it was, I think, the 11th day uh, of the hunt, six days without seeing Last full day hunting. La our, my, our last full day. Um, we had covered this whole mountain range, and we actually looped back to look back in a section that we had looked at for a couple of days and uh, went to this high point that we had been to and looked back up into these ridges across this valley a long ways away and found two rams out on a, um, at noon sitting out on a, a knob. And it was pretty funny. We came up with all these theories of why we weren't seeing rams. They were nocturnal. They were in the timber. <laughs> they were buried in the rocks. And then they blew all of our theories and were sitting out on a grass knob at yeah. noon in the sun. It was so hot, we, well, we, we thought they would go high. I mean, when it's super hot, they generally go high. But the one thing it was not was windy. And, we th you know, the bugs were ferocious down below, like horrible black flies and mosquitoes. Um, and so we just didn't think they would go low. And I think that's probably what they ended up doing. Or just stayed bed in the rocks. They were, mean, just, they were just hidden, you know. Those things, stone sheep, what's, and these stone sheep in particular, because they're dark. Dark. I mean, when they're bedded, almost impossible to see. So we spot these two rams, make close the distance to find out if they're legal. Fortunately, there's four others with them, one legal sheep. 
Um, and we make a move all the way up and around, get in a, uh, these series of cliffs where they're bedded, and, um, or where the legal ram's bedded that we end up shooting. And uh, he was straight down, bedded, a, I think it was 180 yards. My yeah. rangefinder told me to shoot him for 115. But it was such a steep angle, I couldn't get a good rest. So I grabbed the videographer's tripod and mounted my gun on it. Um, we got him aged and figured out he's legal. Um, he knew something was up. He was looking uphill at us. And uh, by the time I got my crosshairs on him, started to pull the trigger, he stood up and was going to walk over an edge. And I didn't calculate for the distance change uh, because of the vertical. And I pulled the trigger, I had this crosshairs around his back, and it went over the top of him. And he took off on a dead run. And he was about 180 yards, as fast as a sheep can run. He was moving. He was moving. I got the crosshairs on his front shoulder and pulled the trigger. And uh, ended up shooting him in the spine and knocked him down. And he went straight to the bottom. Rolled all the way about. Yeah. Yep. And that was about two hours of daylight left in the last day. So it was to mi find the sheep after not seeing the sheep that long, getting in position, and then missing on the first shot. That'll check you. It's a full experience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we got done, and then that was a huge night getting that sheep out of there. We were down in a hole. I think that day we did, what did I say we do, 15.6 miles, uh, 5,000 vertical feet in 16 hours that day. Yeah. Um, got back to camp, and then the next day we got up and did another seven miles to get the sheep out. We were out of food at that point. We got to the strip where we needed to get out. Um, they were hoping to pick us up that evening. Couldn't get us that evening because of weather for the plains, and uh, we ended up having literally eat the sheep to stay alive. Um, called the base camp, had them ride food in to get it, and it got in about midnight just because we were, we were starving. Um, but it ended up being one heck of a trip. Yeah, we got the, we got the full experience. And full experience. You can hunt. That many days and get one on the last day. That's it was awesome and a, and a great big round, huge yeah. base, beautiful silvery. Oh, he's got awesome. beautiful snow and cheese. Like just. It was, Blaze, it was you have awesome. a picture of him. I do. Stand by. McCabe, you got questions coming in yet? Yeah, we actually got quite a few coming in. You want to knock some of them out? Yeah, right let's take a question. We'll get into some of the gear we use and some of the some of the ideas we had around stuff that worked and. Cool. Yeah, that's our sheep. Um, and he's down in the bottom there. Uh, yeah. Beautiful sheep, and you can see how hard those sheep are to see. I mean, he is bedded. I mean, how many times we look over to check him, and yeah. you would, like know where he was, you couldn't see him. I, I peeked over three different times, and he was, you know, whatever he was, one seventy or one eighty from us. Yeah. Had and moved. I, I, every time I knew where he was, and I could not find him until I come kind of like where yeah, there he is. He you was, see his whole Yeah, yep. that's all you could see. They're yeah. they're definitely the hardest sheep to spot. There's no and then the area we w decided to go into is a low density area because, uh, but that area has really good genetics for big yep. rams. Um, and we saw three legal sheep the whole hunt. Not because the area isn't great, the weather was tough, and we chose a low density area to find bigger rams, and I mean, we killed all three. Yep, got them all. I like those averages. Um, yeah. What questions do you have? So, this one came in on Instagram from Western Backcountry Hunter, and he asked Kodiak mid October, what rain gear would you suggest? Yukon. Yukon. Yeah, you're hunting in October on Kodiak, you're going to get brushy and, brushy and yeah. big weather. I mean, it's what we developed Yukon yeah. for hunting Alaska, hunting brush. Um, you're gonna I don't know if you're going on a boat hunt or, or a Regardless. float hunt or whatever. Yeah, you're hundred percent you come for that. Something that's going to beat you up. Yep. Um, this one actually came in twice. Um, Brooks Walker asked it, and then I can't find the other person who asked it. But uh, Brendan, what kind of broadheads did you use? I shot that one with the Grim Reaper. I uh, I generally use a big two blade um, head, but I shot uh, I was shooting the Grim Reaper on this uh, a mechanical because sheep aren't quite as durable and. Long range accuracy and, and high kind of winds and high wind. conditions, yep. Yeah. So, yep. Perfect. Uh, we'll cover one more for now and sure. then we can get into gear. But Joe Rissy asked As a Scarpa employee, great to hear and see our products used and abused and trusted to the fullest. How did you like the new boots? Perfect lead in. So, thank you. Um, you know, Brent and I are biased because we worked, <laughs> we, it was Brent and I that went to the factory last summer, sat down with. Uh, one of, the, uh, one of the owners of, of Scarpa, one of the family members of Scarpa, and they're really intrigued with the success we had in the in the, the high-end boots that we were selling into our market. We convinced them, if you really want to do well in the hunting market, let us design the perfect boot. And it was the first time they've ever allowed yeah. a retailer, I mean, a retailer, come in and design a boot that we only sell. Um, and so we took a combination of, of some of the some of the boots that are in their line to put together the two that we've talked about. But we both war because of the hot weather, the Rebel Ks, and um, I was amazed. It's the weight savings on it, you can you can feel the difference from like the Grand Drew or, or some of the other boots I've worn in the past. The breathability was amazing, especially you notice it in the hot weather. I mean, your feet just don't get that sweaty in them and, and contain a lot of moisture. Um, 
And then the traction was phenomenal and the lack of foot soreness. Because we, we were in rocks the whole time. The whole time. Yeah. And carrying a lot of weight, we moved camp a lot, um, packed out a sheep with it. A lot of side hilling. Nothing, none of it was flat. Uh, and I don't know how your feet felt, but normally on a trip like that, my feet get really sore and they just never recover. I didn't get that with this boot. It's, your feet are drier. Um, you're, you're, using, you're exerting, you know, um, work is weight over distance. You're picking up less weight on every step that you're carrying. I mean, it's just it's just. I don't know if you can zoom in on this, but so this boot I, I took out of the box in July and broke in. Did a lot of training. Did some training hikes with it, but where I'm training, it's, it's hard packed dirt trails mostly. Um, but this boot in the rocks, this is 12 days or 13 days in sheep country. You can see what it'll do to the tread of a boot and the rand of a boot. It's why you need a high performance, high quality product because it literally, you can go through a pair of boots on one sheep hunt if, if you don't have a high quality Vibram sole. Um, but I was amazed at how the traction you get with this yeah. and the rubber content because there's ver varieties of it, whether they want it soft or more durable um, for longevity. This is kind of the perfect balance between the two. But um, I mean, I, it's the probably the most amount of shale I've ever walked on ever <laughs> on any hunt. I mean, there was everything was loose. Nothing was it's really good. heavy, porous, like very sandy. Yep. Um, just wears everything. I don't out. know if you run. Do you run super feet? In yours? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so if you're if you're buying uh, this boot, I highly recommend. And we all do here. Yeah. Superfoot. It gives you the orthotic gives you just more support in your arch. And it gives you support when you're descending, when you're side hilling, and especially when you're carrying heavy weight. It keeps your foot in place and just gives you a more comfortable, better riding experience. Yeah. It keeps foot soreness out. But um, yeah, really, really happy with this boot. <laughs> Someone buys this boot and doesn't think it's the best sheep hunting boot they've ever worn. Um, I'll give them their money back. It's yeah. phenomenal. What do you guys? Uh, what do you guys wear size wise? So I'm 11, I wear a 12. Yeah. I'm always a 12. It's true to size for me. Um, I, I I'm a 10 and a quarter. I wear a 44 <laughs> Europe. So yeah. it's like ten, and uh, I generally you wear do a ten custom work, size. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's a really true. It, it seems like this boot has a little more flexibility as far as width, yeah. because of the lacing comes all the way to the toe, and and compared to like the, um, well, the Grand Drew is pretty wide, um, but the uh, Charmelles is pretty narrow. This kind of fits in, in between. I've noticed that some of our customers with wider feet are able to get in this boot that could, you know previously couldn't get in like the Charmelles. So. It's pretty. It's a pretty good size midway mid range um, fit on that boot. The, the beauty of this synthetic boot for me is that it does not change size. Like on no. day one, it fits like it's going to fit on day ten. It doesn't. You don't get the ever expanding, sucking it tighter, and all of a sudden you got your eyelets are touching at the end of the hunt. But yeah, leather boots, you can't believe this. what yeah. how much they'll change. They're the same size the whole time, which is yep. awesome. So that was good. Um, do you want to answer another? Take another question real quick. We'll get some of the gear you got sit, I have sitting here. We sure. talked about. Let's do it. Uh, Grant Cobb asked, "How did the Peloton 240 vest work?" I, I knew that question was going to come up. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I get to wear it that much because of the temperature. <laughs> earlier in the hunt, yeah, no, <laughs> earlier in the hunt, I, I wore it because we had mixed conditions and some storms that came in. It was fantastic for me, really fantastic on this hunt because I wasn't carrying a jacket. It's got the wind protection in the core, and that thing weighs nothing, packs up to nothing. Um, we both ran the 97 hoodies. Um, on this trip, it was perfect because you have those reasons. I mean, it can be still, even though it's hot, a little cool in the mornings, um, pulling that on and be able to hike in it versus going to like all the way up to the 200, which I carried, which is really almost too warm to hike in in some yep. situations. It was a perfect balance, I thought. Yeah, we had so much sun. It was so hot. I mean, the one thing, I mean, we, got, we just got scorched. There was no, not a cloud in the sky for seven or eight days in a row, so we... Uh, and no timber to hide in. Yeah, so, I mean, the hoodie was really nice. Yeah, Brennan actually just, turned it inside <laughs> out, and it became a sunshade for him. Yep. I thought it was a pretty good idea, so you had to put the fleece side out. And, yeah, and, it uh, was hot. It was. Um, so some of, the, some of the stuff that we brought that I thought would be good to cover, one, when you're hunting in rocky conditions, this thing is, it always blows me away how much I use it. It's so not only for sitting in glass, which is obvious, but around camp, you're camped on shell, you're, you're camped on a rocks, is, I carry this around and drop my knees on it. Whether I'm cooking, whether I'm getting out of my tent, getting dressed, um, and I push it between the frame and the bag like you do, yeah. and you always got it, and uh, it's just it's just I, such I a useful one, tool. one day, and I walked a quarter mile boat, go back to go get it. Like I was not yeah. going to continue on without. I knew it was somewhere, but yeah. So the ice axe I bring, um, I was only one smart enough to bring it this year, <laughs> and everybody that we that was with us used it at some point, but. Um, we used it to dig a platform for the tents. We used it to clear a platform for Don's sheep for pictures, yep. my, my sheep for pictures. 
Um, we also were living off a of snowpack because we were above where the well, you know, quite a ways above where the springs were coming out of the mountains. And so for us, gathering snow that was pretty crusted up, this worked great. Um, I took two trekking poles, and I always, uh, generally on every trip, I'll have one thing where I go, man, I wish I'd have brought that, and I wish I'd had one yeah. too. So. And it just looks cool yeah. in a trekking yeah, pole. Yeah, it does. <laughs> but it's such a useful tool. Yeah. It always surprises me how, how much I use it and how, much, how many people that are with us, whether it's a guide or not, go, man, that's a good, that is a useful tool. Yeah. And they always kind of snicker when I, like, ice axe? Like, <laughs> you're not going to see ice. Yeah. Um, that was great. Um, something we learned about snow. So I, I've done a lot of backpack hunting up high. I've lived off a of snowpack in Nevada. Um, and uh, what I learned from the guides up there was, and then we normally, I never filter on sheep hunts. Yeah. You know, we usually drink it out of springs or fast-moving rivers that I've never had Girardeau. I don't know if you oh, have up there. Not, not on, not on that time. Um, but the guides up there, we, we took snowpack, we melted it, and we filtered it. And what we learned is that the caribou and the sheep will... When it's hot, we'll get it, and we saw it. Yeah, they a live lot. on the snow. They'll live on the snow, and then you get feces and urine on it, and it's an easy way to get Girardeau. I think both the guides have had it in the past yeah. by not filtering snow. So, a tip for, for all of us is if you're going to live off a of snowpack in sheep country, filter it. Because um, I wouldn't have, and I probably got So, how we got like 80% of our water on that hunt was uh, big black plastic bags or the or the waterproof. Um, we bags. use roll top dry bags. Roll top dry bags. We fill woods. them up as cl- full as you can get with water, leave them in the sun. Obviously, it's hot. Yeah. And let and it, it, would, it would melt, and then that night we filter it, um, and we had enough snow. And, and yeah, it was you know the, the the animals living on the on the snow was crazy. Yeah. We we snuck around on one one day, and here's a cow caribou just relieving herself all over the glacier right in front of us. They're like, good thing we're filtering. Good thing we're hey Blaze, you have that picture of us on the snow? Yeah. So this this day was the hottest day we had. Uh, we gone out to to glass. And it just, the wind stopped, and it was just sweltering. Uh, we had no protection. We were literally hiding under our trekking poles with jackets over the top, and then worked down the ridge and found the snowpack. It's actually where the caribou was uh, relieving <laughs> herself all over that. And we, yeah. we found snow, and we just dove in it. And you see how hot yeah. Brendan is. He was like, ah. Oh. Dying. Yep. We made snow cones. Um, some, of the others, some of the other items I brought that, and something I don't know if I talked about before I left, but... I bring wet wipes, uh, like all of us do. It's a, they're great not only for obvious, obvious reasons, but also just cleaning yourself up. You don't have access to water, um, cleaning cuts, and we'll talk about that in a second. But one, one tip I have on this, I don't know if I've covered, is I'll dehydrate my wet wipes. Because you're bringing 10 days' worth of wet wipes, they're pretty heavy when they're wet. So I'll dehydrate them, then I get up on the mountain, I'll take a few out, wet them up, and then put them, in, put them back in this. It's, if you're into saving grams and ounces, like I am, oh, no. all just kind of little tips. Um, for the first time on a trip, I've needed first aid, pretty yeah. seriously. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you have that picture. Do you have a picture of Brendan's finger? Get the bloody one up, boys. Yeah. So we were going down this knife ridge on, like, the fifth day. Um, really steep, nasty, technical, scary um, descent. And Brendan had had his hand down on a piece of, I mean, it was a slab the size of a manhole cover of shale. So it was, And it was reasonably thick and really sharp. That thing slid on him and banged his finger into another rock behind it. Caught me against it, like fast. Like I thought I would. Oh, it was I, quick. Yeah, just instantly happened, and, and I, I actually. Fortunately, thought, I had gloves on. Yeah, luckily I had gloves on, but I thought I lost my finger. It was that. Heavy oh yeah, and, I thought you did too. Yeah, and it, uh, uh, you had the look on your face like you did. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. Uh, yeah, it was gnarly. But I don't know if you could what, what it shows up on camera, but it was not only cut on one side to the bone, but it was cut on the other side to the bone. Um, and fortunately, I, I've carried first aid. I rarely ha- ever have to use it. This time we needed it. Um, just as a tip, I mean, bring the good band-aids, bring stuff to clean it. Uh, we had Neospore, and we kept it uninfected, which is amazing to me, yep. for the rest of the trip. And it was, wasn't a clean cut. Normally we bring super glue so we could, instead of stitching, we can glue it. But it was so, because it, it was a blunt force trauma, it just blew the skin apart. Yep. Um, we, couldn't, we couldn't glue it, so we probably should have had yeah, I ended up wrapping it up and just covering it in Neosporin and basically making a cast. I had, had athletic tape with us, had um, yeah. dehydrated some, or the, some of the wet wipes I would use every day and just covered up. I basically, you know, if you're not within 12 hours of getting stitched, there was not really much I could do. It was, I, I thought. You weren't going out. Yeah, there's not, I'm not leaving. So if I lose a finger, I lose yeah. a finger. But yeah. it, uh, I managed to keep it clean. Doctor looked at it when I got back. Everything is, is, is pretty good, but definitely could have used about seven stitches. So. Yeah, yeah. Just as, I mean, like I said, I, I carry it all the time. Um, yeah. And hopefully you never have to use it. We did on this case. Um, the other thing is just these little storage bags we sell. 
I mean, they're, they're, they're so convenient. You can always find your stuff. You keep stuff organized. You keep stuff. And I like the small ones because you don't have to have one big bag with lots of stuff in it. So I, I carry a lot of these. Just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, we need to sell this spoon. <laughs> this is a uh, Sea to Summit. It's a titanium long handle spoon. Um, highly recommend it for yep. a mountain house. It keeps your hands clean. Yep. You get down on the bottom and clean it. Uh, they don't weigh anything. Uh, we spent quite a few nights in our headlamps. Um, yep. One night in a storm, the night coming out with my sheep. And you know, I had talked about this headlamp before uh, I went in, but just it reminded me how great uh, uh, this headlamp is because of how powerful it is and the lumens. And we had a, a rock mountain, literally, that we called, we ended up calling it, what, the Tower of Doom. Tower of Doom. Because <laughs> there wasn't a trail on the backside. The other side was cliffs. And we had to come underneath rock that was just all broken shale. And, uh, yeah, you can kind of see the start of it there, Blaze, in that picture, the headlamp on. You on that? Mm -hmm. And uh, that night, you know, we, we cut a trail across, but it was the only trail that existed at the elevation when we go across. And uh, we, it was, took us a while to find it. And uh, having a really bright headlamp in those situations is just always reminds me how important sure, We'll be packing that one next time. Yeah. <laughs> Brendan took my backup because the one he had wasn't one of the more powerful. Faulty, yeah. And I always bring a really good backup, not just an emergency backup, because um, if you need it in that country, it can save your life. What's uh, the name of those headlamps? We're getting a couple questions about it. Yeah, this is a Petzl Now, and we sell it on our site. Don't buy it from anyone else, and then because it's not as good. And this is the Reactic, and both of these are um, uh, they have that uh, reaction lighting to it, so it'll vary the lumens depending on what you're looking at. So as you drop your headlamp down, to, let's say to look at something close, it lowers the amount of light that's coming out of it, and you raise your headlamp up, and it blasts out uh, more lumens to give you better visibility at distance, and it saves the battery that way. It's, it's pretty amazing. Both rechargeable. Yeah, both rechargeable. I'll bring a backup battery to this, um, and then um, for power source, like I talked about, bring this large goal zero and then the smaller stick, and this combination stays, at, stays with my tent. Um, when I'm out hunting today, the smaller stick is recharged if I've used it, and that stays in my pack, so i got backup power. And then I'll put this, the goal zero, panel on my tent like I did every day, and this is uh, recharging. I had plenty of power on this on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, it's as good a system I found for that's lightweight and backpacking. Um, one, one thing to note, though, these uh, solar panels don't charge quickly. So if you're planning, like, hey, I'll bring a solar panel and a battery and I'm fine, bring another battery pack because um, it doesn't put that much juice into your battery, um, but it does help put some back in every day. Um, and then one of the products I tested uh, that isn't out yet is um, the bullet carrying system, bullet loops on the bottom of a of our vinyl harness. And this isn't available yet, but it will be coming out at some point in the future. And it's all attached through Velcro, but such a great location for bullets. Out of the way, easy to grab, uh, kind of a natural place to pull one out. That worked really well. Um, we have a um, some other attachments that we'll be doing on that vinyl harness in the future. I won't cover today. But uh, what else did you bring that you thought was useful? Um, you know, the bow holder um, on on my setup was really handy. Um, even for even packing the ram out, just just keeping my you know it's it's such hard country that beats up your bow it so does, much yeah. that any time you can have you know your cams and your strings protected, the SFS bow kit yeah. is like, I mean, you know, the bow is. Even in, in eight days, from yeah. brand new to basically really yeah. scratched up, but nothing. Blaze, do you have any pictures of the country you're in that gives people some perspective of what we're dealing with? Um, any questions you want to cover, McKay? They're coming in. I knew this one was going to come in, but this one's in from Joe Flores. How did the new padded travel bag hold up? Aha! Uh -huh. Yeah, cool. Good question. It was great. I mean, talk, we we struggle with luggage to get our stuff up and back, and this is that concept travel bag. Worked perfect. The size wise was perfect. The, the amount of equipment full still with, with Kuyu stuff was under 50 pounds. And I pack all my own food, as you guys know. So there's a lot going north. Um, I brought that with a Teku, the new 5,500 cubic inch Teku bag. And I had my pack in it and boots. Um, and between the two bags, it was perfect. Traveled well. I put the gun case on top of it, strapped it down, and rolled it right through the airport. What was the total weight of your pack with 10 days? So we weighed it at the horses. It was 43 pounds. 43 pounds. 10 so days of with water? Ten days of food, uh, hydration bag not filled, um, but everything else. Tent, sleep bag, ten days of food, forty-three pounds. Yeah. I think yours came in at. I was. Uh, I, I brought the ninety-five Swaro scope and a yeah. big tripod, so I think I was at right at fifty. Right at fifty yeah. with optics. Yep. Yeah. Um, and you brought the ninety-five Swaro. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that was. I think it's awesome. 
it wasn't enough. I didn't spot enough sheep. <laughs> <laughs> we tried. Yeah. We tried. Um, so what, do you have anything else you want to cover uh, as far as questions, McCade? Yeah, this one, this one came in, and, and uh, it was from Forrest Peck. And he asked, going out on my first sheep hunt next Friday in Idaho, I have great Congratulations gear. on the tag, Forrest. Yeah. Good for you. Uh, I have great rain gear, but could use a set of clothing. If I could only afford one set of clothing, shirt plus pant, what should I get? Our rain gear. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would. You know, if you're looking for what to buy from us, uh, you can never go on with a tack pant. It's our most versatile pant. It's our number one selling pant. You want a more technical pant, Alpine's a great choice. Um, Tiburon for this time of year is yep. also a good choice. Is what Brennan hunted I, in. I ran a Tiburon on this stone sheep hunt. I, I looked at a long-term forecast and said, it looks it's pretty hot. hot. I'm going to wear Tiburon. And I, wish I was I, glad I, I did. I kind of <laughs> wish I had, I had Tiburon. But if you want a knee padded pant with more pocketing, the Alpine was fantastic. I loved it on this trip. And then, you know, the guy jacket would be a, a, a something to think about or some of our insulation pieces. And I always recommend Super Down. If you can pick one jacket to buy first from Kuyu, buy the Super Down because it can save your life and keeps you really warm, doesn't weigh anything, yeah. especially the new Ultra. Awesome. Uh, we've got another one to cover. Bob Bark Barkernar, uh, what's your favorite mountain house? Ah, <laughs> good question. Great uh, question. Definitely not Chili Mac. That's my know. favorite. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, it's nice. I mean, not to hike with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's actually banned yeah. in my camp. No one's allowed to bring chili mac. Uh, I like the lasagna's awesome. I don't know if you guys had lasagna. Stick, the cheese sticks to your spoon, so it gives you something to do after you're done eating it. Uh, I like the stroganoff and the macaroni and cheese. I mean, really, all of them are pretty darn good. I mean, it, there's a few better than others. Like, I stay away from the chili, but... I go through phases. Sometimes I like the mashed potatoes and chicken. This hunt, for whatever reason, I, the, the chicken teriyaki was the one I, I think I had seven. Of the, uh, Did that you? was the one I, I liked the best, the chicken teriyaki. Don't worry, you, know? you don't have OCD. Yeah, yeah. Just, <laughs> you like it, you love it. Yeah. And then the breakfast, I mixed it up. I brought uh, some of the granola and blueberries on this trip, the mountain house breakfast, and then a skillet, and I tried the biscuits and gravy, which I'm not a big biscuits and gravy guy, but it was kind of nice because it's got 600 calories in, in one bag. I did... Uh, Blueberries and I did the blueberries mountain house uh, yeah. every third day and then every uh, every basically every morning I did two two things of oatmeal. I'm not a big breakfast eater, so I kind of have to force not myself. Not a big eater at all. Yeah. Being a wrestler, college wrestler, yeah. uh, and then I felt like my food mix this trip was about as good as I've ever done. I had 4,256 calories per day, including my mountain house, um, but my lunch mix felt like I was hungry, but I wasn't ever starving, ever feeling like I was. Um, tapped as far as energy, uh, and I think I, I had a lot of fat in my mix in, in the calories per ounce um, mix this year, and uh, felt pretty good. I'm going to put together what my food menu was. I also have a gear list from this trip. I'm going to give to McCade. We're going to find a place to put it up on the site, and we'll make an announcement of it and where you can locate it and download it because uh, I think it's really useful. The, the gear list for me keep me from overpacking primarily and making sure that I've got everything. But really, it's keeping your pack. Um, light and um, not packing too many things because it's easy to go, oh, I'll just throw that in. I, I find that the last 10 minutes before I go and leave and head on the, whether it was on the horses or anything, like if I can keep something out of my pack for yeah. the last 10 minutes, my pack will stay light. Totally. And we've been doing it so long, I always come back and go through my gear list and scratch off what I needed or what I would bring that was different. One other pretty cool tool, so I bought this new Garmin Phoenix 5 uh, before I left on the trip. The uh, UC Davis Human Performance Lab that we did our weight performance study, the guy said, can you bring um, something to track your distance, your elevation gain, descended, and then also your heart rate, and then we can take what we learned from the study and put it to, to a real test to look at the data that comes out of it. So I bought the Phoenix 5 War heart rate monitor the whole time. And then um, what's really cool about this, this program is it um, has a link to your phone, and then it gives you a calendar, and it can take you and if you can see this, but breaks down each day. So I can go to, let's say, this is August 10th, and that day we did 13.71 miles, and we did 5,000 vertical feet in 15 hours. We we're out from camp. Um, it also has map, so it'll tell you where you went, and also uh, you can have it in satellite format or, or just regular map format, um, and it breaks down some pretty pretty cool data. So it tells you your average pace, your average speed. It tells you um, how much time you're actually moving because we do a lot of glassing. So out of 15 hours, for example, we only move for 5.37 hours of it. Um, and we and during that 5.37 hours is when we traveled that 15 miles. We uh, That particular day, like I said, we climbed 5,000 vertical feet, descended 
um, 5,000 vertical feet because we came back to camp. And it measures your heart rate. My average heart rate was seven, 107. High was 150 that day. Um, and we're going to take all this data and give it to the human performance lab and break it, was, it down. It was really cool every day because he'd come in and say, how far do you think we went? And we were consistently low. I was, I was kind of surprised. I was always way low on what we thought we did. Yep. Like, I don't know, I don't know nine, nine miles or something, like 13. You know? Well, and the vertical was pretty, yeah. pretty impressive, too. Um, it's just neat to start to capture this data and try to, try to use it to help you know, analyze weight and performance and, and break it down so we have science behind what we do, which yeah. is always fascinating to me. So I'll keep you posted on what we learn from the lab um, and the future of the studies we close out. There'll be a film about it, and we can cover it. So um, any more questions you want to cover? Just open it up now at this point if people are still watching and interested. Yeah, so Jonathan Souls asked, what kind of tent did you use, one man or two man? I'm going on a 10-day hunt in Colorado, and I'm looking to buy a tent to use. So uh, for his hunt, I'd rec definitely recommend the tent I took, which is the Mountain Star. Uh, it's our tried and true tent uh, that, that I worked on designing from the beginning. Um, what I love about it is, I mean, it's a two-person tent, but it's a great person tent. You've got two vestibules, two side entrances, lots of space inside to organize gear and hang out in. Uh, for sheep hunts, it's nice because you might get weathered in that tent for multiple days to be able to move around, be able to sit up. Uh, it just, it's just such a great tent. It's only over, just a little over three pounds. Freestanding. Freestanding, really, really good in high winds and, and even with some decent snow loads. Yep. And you took a prototype. I took a shelter on this one just to confirm how much I don't like shelters on sheep hunts um, to really drive it home. But, I, yeah, I had a, uh, a tension shelter. Um, a basically proto like prototype. Prototype. It, it wasn't floorless, but it was basically like a floorless shelter. And the problem we, I ran into is that uh, in the kind of country we're hunting, there's so much loose rock, there's no solid ground. And so to anchor something that needs pressure both up and down and when you don't have solid ground, um, I just I can't recommend you it. You know, it's also, unless it was dead level, which we never were, yep. it's hard to get that to pitch right. Yep. And so you end up collapsing, your usable space gets yep. taken in. And we, you carried a, the floor in the bug mesh. We had to have it. And it you have to have it in that country. Horrible. But it just ends up using space. And then the front entrance was was challenging, I noticed, as well. You looked like you had to do yoga to get in out of there. Yeah, right? it was the reverse crab to get into it. And, and, and at the end of the day... <laughs> The one night we got back, it was absolutely dumping rain as hard as you could dump. The, the one really big storm we got, and we had to set our tents up in the dark, and it just took way longer, and it was just, I, I, you know, a freestanding tent is nice. You just pop it up. It's waterproof as it's coming up with the exo. Our design, yeah. You know, it pops open, and you can climb in, and you're yeah. done. So I would, but that's I would how we go with a freestander. I, I tested it. I, I gave it the full. Yeah. I went in with an open mind and came out, closed that chapter for me. Yeah. Attack gloves. Yeah, they're fantastic. Save my finger. Yeah. <laughs> what I loved about them is, you know, that, that, what's great about the tack love is the petard's leather that has no liner, so it's right against your hand, so you've got great dexterity. The more you wear that leather, the thinner it gets, but you, it doesn't ever wear through. And then the fabric on the back being just a single layer, not a soft shell, breathes really well. It was awesome. I mean, I wore it every day. The, you know, the dexterity is amazing. Yeah. You don't have to save our hands. Yeah. That's, yeah, that country. Highly recommend it. Awesome. Anything else? There's a lot. <laughs> keep, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Um, so Jeff Harrison asked, "Hi, bro. I know you." Hey, Jeff. What's up, man? <laughs> I know right you on. Let's get here for you. Preparation uh, leading up to your hunts. How did you feel on this hunt? And are there any adjustments you'd make to your physical preparation in the future? Thanks, Jeff. Great, Great question. questions. Yeah, I, I mean, I train as you know uh, year round for sheep hunting, and depending on the time of year, changes up what I do, um, and I'm always tweaking. I'm always playing around with the different types of training. I learned, I've learned a lot from the Human Performance Lab at Davis, the first study we did a couple years ago about interval training and how often to do it. Um, and one of the challenges I have is I like to train, so I have a tendency to overtrain going into a hunt. I've gone into hunts where I've got you know tendonitis or um, AT bands inflamed because I've just overdone it. I felt like I really got enough rest in between really hard workouts on this trip or before this trip, and I felt as good as I've ever felt Going on the trip, and I think a lot of it was you know really heavy interval training, um, quite a few uh, long workouts with a heavy pack. You know, getting up to 90 pounds and hiking like I did some heat training, which was freaking great on this trip. Uh, you know, hiking middle of the day was over 100 degrees with 90 pound pack for three hours. I mean, just you know, kind of getting yourself set up so that hard days training aren't that different than the hard days on the mountain, and uh, it really paid off on the trip that I needed it. You know, I went into a deal, and I got a little injury in one of my hips, and I, I kind of took the slow on this one. I probably trained a, a less intense on this than I have for any hunt, and I actually felt pretty good considering, I mean, my I mean, boots are great. always can climb. So but but my, my, uh, it really forced me to dial my gear in. Like, uh, my pack was as light as it's ever been. I actually took a 5200 on this trip. 
because I was just like, I'm going to go as light as possible, and uh, I felt great. Yeah. So. Okay, I think we'll do one more. Sure. Awesome. Good questions, by the way. Good Jeff, questions. I hope you're doing well, buddy. Thanks yeah. for the, thanks for the questions. Let's see. So let's let's cover this question from John D. Martinez. What packing system did you use for this hunt? Packing system, as far as I, I would think, it's he's asking Backpack? about the pack that you yeah. used. I ran a prototype pack. It's essentially taking the Ultra 6000, and we put side pockets on it like we have on the icons, so you can put spotting scopes in the sides or store other gear, and then added some pocketing on the inside, which you know the Ultras don't have any, um, and kind of up on the front end of the inside panel, so you unzip the pocket, and it's on the back of there with... Uh, Sean designed it with kind of vertical zippers. It was really nice. It was, a, I think, it was a perfect balance for me on the trip. Size-wise, was was awesome. Um, I don't need a 7,200-inch pack on that hunt. And then just kind of the storage and the mix for me was about perfect. And it's light. It's, um, you know, it's not much heavier than the than the Ultra 6000. And I ran the Icon suspension for packing heavy loads on this trip. And uh, that bag and I loved my setup. It was it was great. Yeah, I ran the Icon Pro 5200, and what I really really liked on this trip that we used a lot since we were camped and would move was uh, was running that pack lidless. Yeah, I did the lot, same thing, and oh, I really liked that feature to to be able to. Cause I was you know when we were moving camp, we were about 50 pounds, you know, as our food went down less, and then during the day I was hunting with about 26 pounds total. Which was and that really pack nice. has a shroud that folds over yep. and clips in, which is I want to Just add to nice the pack. Nice and clean, and it was great. Yep. Um, yeah, it was it was good. Let's get one more. We'll wrap it up. Good. This one came in a couple times um, about water filters and what system you use for water. Yeah, well, the, we used a pump up up where we were just because that's what the guide had. Normally, I, I don't pump anymore. Platypus makes a gravity-fed hydration or filter system that's awesome. Um, I've also used Caden to makes one that's a little bit bigger bag. Um, if you haven't used gravity-fed uh, systems, they're awesome. It's essentially a big bag. Scoop up the water, you close the top, you hang it up, and it has a hose that comes out of the bottom of the bag with a filter. Some of the filters either in the bag or in the in line in the hose, and it runs out pretty quickly, and has a, a cinch. And I never pump water anymore. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, I think we figured it out one day. We basically in ten days both drank about our water weight and in, in, our weight in water. Yeah. And it was we were going through a lot. We were melting a lot of water. We were filtering a lot of water. And we, was it a ketadine we used? And it was the, about the done at the end. Yeah. It was about we, done. The, we blew up the filter, yeah. yeah. We just yeah. clogged it up. And I brought two three-liter uh, bags. One is a backup and for, for a camp. That's also something I wanted to bring up is have an extra uh, three-liter bag is, was awesome on this trip because we'd fill it up if we hit a spring yeah. and, and have an extra water bag to, to melt water or store water was important on this trip. Um, yeah, These question. kind of trips, you just never know what you're going to get. If you just told us we're going in there, you're going to see 90 degrees in northern British Columbia. I said, I doubt it. Yeah, exactly. But we saw 90 degrees. Yep. I mean, it was it was hot. Used a lot of water. I mean, you just you got to be prepared for it all. Yeah, it was. Yeah. You want to do one more? Sure. Yeah. Okay. These are great questions, guys. Yeah. This one's coming in from Instagram uh, from Dominic underscore Predator. Did you have any hard lessons on this sheep hunt? You know, you always learn a lot. I mean, lessons come in, in several different ways on a trip like this. One is just the mental fortitude to stay positive, um, stay patient, and stay believing. It's When you go that many days, and I mean, we're in amazing sheep country. I mean, it's pristine sheep habitat and country, sheep trails everywhere. We knew there were sheep there, and we couldn't find them. And for us, that's rare. I mean, we're really good at glassing. We're really good about pulling country apart. We've got the best optics in the world. And you can't find sheep. The conditions are miserable. It's hot. You're exhausted. And um, you just have to have that mindset of, we're going to get it done. you got to believe. you got to believe. And I remember we woke up the last morning, and Brennan goes, tells me the story. What was the story Willie told you? And it was just so true. I mean, it happened to us. Yeah, I, I Buddy of mine who guided, you know, he went nine days in a row to the same base, and it was like a 10-mile horseback ride, and the last day they got up, and he he said, we're doing it again. Well, his the, client asked the, him, like, the, are we sure are we, we should do the same thing? Yeah. We've done it nine days in a row. It hasn't worked he out. He said, they're going to be there on the 10th day. They rode in there was nine rams in the base, and he killed them. It was and the same just, thing. I mean, you know, you just don't know with stone sheep, especially because you can't find them very easily. And, uh, I mean, I learned a big lesson on that one is you just got to keep grinding, keep grinding, keep grinding. And I never thought we wouldn't get one. I mean, it was noon before we found one the last day, and I still believe that day we're going to locate yeah. something and get it done. But 
Um, you know, it, a lot. You know, at times it was like, man, is this, maybe we should just pull out of here. Maybe it's done. Maybe this is going to work out. Yep. Um, and it can happen last minute like it did for us. You got to hunt on the last day as hard as you hunt on the first day. Yeah. And it'll it'll keep working out. And I think a lot of that comes to prep, making sure you had enough food. Your food's good. I mean, and we learned a lesson. I mean, I always bring on food because it's something I control. Our videographer Matt, that filmed this hunt, we told him he didn't listen to us. <laughs> Not that Quentin or or really doesn't though. do a good job. <laughs> But they don't do a lot of backpack hunts, and yeah. they packed his lunches, and he was about done with his food about before noon every day. He didn't complain, but he, I could he, tell he was starving. He was starving, right? <laughs> yeah. And those are the variables and controls yeah. that you can take control of, and I always tell people, control everything you control in these hunts because there's a lot you can't, yeah. and it lets you get to that last day and lets yeah. you stay mentally strong um, in conditions that are tough or if the hunting's tough or, or like the last day coming out. I mean, it was a harder day as I've had in the pack. It was nasty. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, good questions. Yeah, awesome questions today. Well, well, thank you. I hope this is helpful. Um, like I said, we're here for all of our customers. You guys have any additional questions, email them into customer service. We have gear experts. You can get a hold of Brandon. We'll build gear lists. We want our customers to be successful. Yeah. We're, we're going to put this up, all the gear lists and the food prep. On. Yeah, I'll get it put together. Yeah. It'll be up sometime next week, and yeah. we'll make an announcement about it. But, uh, um, yeah, we always learn a lot of this stuff. Yeah, thanks for checking in. Yeah, I appreciate the interest, and thanks for tuning in.